the request of the judge. The court made it clear that it is willing to support the operation in any way possible, and there, I think, is what you're referring to, Judge Riley, to include staffing and scheduling, to include staffing and scheduling. Do the records indicate clearly that uh, the judge at this time understood that the object of the raid was agri processors and the defendant and our appellate here uh, at that time? The judge has denied, and again, we have no... She did not permit any discovery. There was no way that we could go beyond that. She has denied in a statement that she knew it was agri-processing. I didn't ask you what she denied. I asked you, is there any evidence? Well, we think that there is evidence that implies that. May, may I point to the fact that um, uh, at the very first, this is on uh, Appendix 268, when the uh, U.S. attorney is briefed, regarding the number of criminal prosecutions that they intend to pursue relative to the investigation. And it immediately thereafter says that the U.S. attorney, that the U.S. attorney said that they would prosecute agri-processors, and it says at Appendix 268 that the U.S. attorney advised that they had provided Judge Reed with a briefing regarding the number of criminal prosecutions that they intend to pursue relative to this investigation. That's right after he is saying that they will pursue criminal offenders in addition to the target company agri-processors if possible. Now, I, that, I don't say that's conclusive evidence, but I say it certainly gives rise to the inference that the U.S. attorney who is telling the Immigration Service, we will prosecute agri-processors, and I talk to Judge Reed about the number of criminal prosecutions we intend to bring, that the name agri-processors was raised at that point. Indeed, in addition to that, let me point to the fact that in the, quote, executive summary that the Immigration Service says was the game plan or the report that the U.S. Attorney gave to the district judge, that executive summary specifically mentions and names agri-processors. It appears in the appendix and the uh, the uh, Immigration Service says that executive summary, it's at page 306 of the appendix, the executive summary, which the Immigration Service says is the report that the U.S. Attorney could give to Judge Reed, it begins with the fact that on October 1, 2007, the uh, RAC Cedar Rapids, which is the agent in charge in Cedar Rapids, opened a worksite investigation relating to Agri-Processors, Inc., located in Postville, Iowa. That's what the executive summary says. And we say that from the documents, the inference is that this executive summary is what the U.S. attorney told to Judge Reed. Now, again, Judge Reed has said she doesn't know. I'm not here today to test that credibility, but I am here to say to, say to the court that at the very least, these documents warrant, at, I say, at the least, a remand to the district court to another judge with an instruction that there be an evidentiary hearing on exactly what it was that was told to Judge Reed and what she said. Now, that may only require testimony from immigration service officials, from assistant U.S. attorneys. We're not saying here today that we want to put a district judge on the stand. We are very sensitive. Let me be sure that I emphasize to the court that from the defendant's perspective, this is not, it's the first time in 50 years practice that I've ever made such an allegation regarding a district judge. I will tell the court, I looked at those documents. I'm the one who first saw that these immigration service documents indicated that Judge Reed had participated. I was shocked. I almost fell off my chair when I saw it. Uh, how do you compare that to the mill run criminal cases where uh, the judges always get involved before the prosecution because they're proving arrest warrants, search warrants, um, and they certainly coordinate there. They, they coordinate when they're available 
and uh, when they're going to do it, and so on and so forth. How do you how do you compare those? I think it, the comparison <laughs> is that in those cases there is always a record. The prosecutor, and I've been a prosecutor years ago, goes to the judge and says, here's an affidavit for a search warrant. The affidavit is there. If there's going to be some oral testimony to justify the search warrant, there's oral testimony that is transcribed. In this case, the meetings were not transcribed. They were not recorded well, but, in any way. You know, we review particularly state court proceedings all the time where they get search warrants and arrest warrants from judges and there's no transcript. It's, you have an affidavit from an officer and, and a, a, a signed warrant and that's it. Well, how, how do, I, I don't think your distinction is correct in that I, there just aren't transcripts in those proceedings. Well, first of all, let me say that I think both we had there were two experts, leading national experts on ethics, judicial ethics and lawyers' ethics, who we submitted these issues to to see what they would say about it. Mark Harrison, who was the chair of the ABA committee on the Code of Judicial Conduct. Well, I, you know, I saw those. I understand what you're saying, but can you understand? You're asking us to write an opinion that says that the, the judicial officer, the court, cannot get involved pre-indictment. That would turn the system upside down uh, uh, because of, uh, you know, what the mill run case is, that they are involved. Now, I'm looking for, to you to tell me how do we distinguish that? How, do, how, in your view, do we say, well, in these kind of cases you can get involved, but in these kind of cases you cannot get involved? I think that the kind of cases where the government presents a very specific request for a warrant, for a search, or for an arrest, or for a raid to a judge, we're not challenging the fact if Judge Reed had signed the warrant for the raid, and that was the first that she saw of this case, we wouldn't challenge it. We'd say, okay, that's part of the regular process, and ordinarily, that is subject to a record. I cited the, uh, the experts because both experts say that one of the key errors, again, not reflecting on the judge or the prosecutor, but one of the key errors that is made, that was made in this case, was that there was no record kept of the transactions. When, even in a state court, I think, when a prosecutor comes into a judge and says, Your Honor, I want a search warrant, I want an arrest warrant, there's a time when this is done, and everybody knows he's gone in, he's asked for it, he's submitted an affidavit. Well, some of these come in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're, they're not even done in a courthouse. No, they're not done, in, but there's a, there is a, a, an affidavit that's submitted. There's some sworn basis. We know that what the judge had to go on, and there are cases certainly where those things are challenged because the judge should not have issued the warrant on the basis of the affidavit that was submitted. But the affidavit is there. It's before the court. It's before the public. And everybody knows what the judge is doing. It's the judge's job to approve whether there's probable cause or not. It is. Hey, I, I have one other question on this, on this topic. Um, and I, I think this is part of your burden on this. Um, your argument is that, uh, well, let me ask it this first way. Do you, do you claim or have any evidence of personal bias or prejudice of the judge? No. Now, my question is, which I think is your argument, um, that because of, because of the judge's involvement, um, it relates, I think you say, it relates to the fairness of the trial. And I'd like you to explain that. How does it relate to the fairness of the trial? Well, let me say first, Judge Riley, that in every recusal case, including your opinion in the, in the Fletcher case, the assumption has been, and that was the Supreme Court in Lilleberg, that if a judge should have recused him or herself, that's the end of the matter. The judge who should have recused him or herself had no business presiding at the trial, and the trial is wiped out. So there's not 
I know the government is arguing you have to show that there's some prejudice at the trial. The answer is no. By having a judge who should not have presided at the trial under the federal statute. No, but but that's you understand, you may very well be right, but your state, your case becomes stronger if you can point us to, well, to something in the trial and say because the judge was involved in the what occurred first, she had this information, she made this ruling. Uh, that she would not have otherwise have made if she didn't have this information uh, early on or something like that. Do you have anything that you can point to in that? I cannot point to something that says that it emanated from the planning of the raid, no. But I do have many rulings in the course of the trial, and we cite them in our brief, culminating in an issue that obviously I'm not going to get to, which is a 27-year jail sentence, essentially a life sentence for a man who's 51 years old. And, but a number of rulings during the trial, and if you, the court just opens up the transcript of the trial, every day there were discretionary rulings, as I read through the transcript, in which the judge says, okay, objection sustained. Your Honors, no that trial judges have an enormous amount of leeway. And if someone, if a judge becomes, as we submit this judge did, without any proof of uh, that we have a bias, but nonetheless she becomes part of the prosecution team, she says to the prosecutors weeks before the raid, give me a final okay, game. Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, I, I was looking for that you could give me a series of rulings or in the trial well, or something. But, we we, but uh, your time's running out. Uh, I think it's probably in your brief. In our brief, we do okay. cite a series of rulings. Yes, transcript references with a series of rulings in which the judge ruled against the defense on various discretionary matters, which she issued decisions on, including, by the way, the order of the trials. After all, that was a key question. What is the sequence of these trials going to be? And she ruled in favor of the government to have the bank fraud, the financial charges, tried first. Okay, now, I think this sentence is very important, so I'm going to give you additional time. It's less than me. You have five more minutes. I want you to give, give us your argument on the sentence. The sentence has two parts to it. Uh, one is a, a part of the sentence which involves ten years in terms of Mr. Roboshkin's sentence, which is the money laundering issue. That, we submit, is clearly controlled by the Santos case, and I must say, by Your Honor's opinion, that preceded the Santos case, the Fithian case, in which Your Honor said, in an opinion, exactly uh, prophesying the Supreme Court's result in the Santos case, that you could not charge as money laundering anything other than what would be the proceeds of... Uh, illegal activity. In this case, the indictment clearly alleges that the money that allegedly was laundered was part of the alleged criminal scheme. In order to carry it out, says the indictment, it was necessary to deposit these funds because that was the way, and this appears at, in the indictment at pages 32 and 33 of the appendix, that portion of the indictment, the government, that was the government's theory. These deposits were part of the fraud. And therefore, under Santos and the jury's uh, uh, clear finding that these were not profits, the money laundering charges should have been dismissed with the jury's verdict. That makes a difference of 10 years in Mr. Roboshkin's sentence. What else? The sentence was... The guideline calculation, which is the first step, was excessive because rather than 